Yes, so you can join her for lunch maybe uh, and ask more questions. Uh, you know, that might be one good option. Same for other lecturers, you know, join for lunch to ask more questions. Of course, you can ask questions on Zoom as well. Meanwhile, we go to Gary Bernstein, who is going to continue talking about weak gravitational lensing. Hello again, everybody. I hope you still remember something from yesterday. Uh, I'm going to continue today with uh, describing how the general topics that I, we discussed yesterday of what shear and magnification are and how they're related to mass. Yesterday, we were talking about just a single circularly symmetric lens. First thing I'm going to do is just lead you through rather quickly some the formalism about how we take a circularly symmetric lens and we make formulas that are for an arbitrary mass distribution in two and then three dimensions, and then turn that into things like power spectra that you've learned earlier in the week are the, the key, some of the key observational quantities, the things that we're gonna get predictions about once we have a model for cosmology, for dark matter, as Elise was talking about, et cetera. Okay. And then I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about the techniques that are used to actually measure these, uh, these shear fields from images of the sky. I'll give you a brief introduction to that. I, I may rush through those things a little bit because I, I would like to try to leave some time at the end for you to try to analyze a simulated catalog of galaxy shapes that I have on the notebook on the collab, right? Uh, if your arms aren't too tired from rowing, uh, or paddling to type on your computer later today. So, all right, so let's get going here. Uh, if you recall, we had yesterday a, uh, a formula for uh, the deflection of light that uh, the theta, the source position of an object is equal to the image position minus some constants. And then we had this expression here for the mass uh, divided by the impact parameter. Now this is for the circularly symmetric lens case. We can make a generalization of that to an arbitrary mass distribution. And it looks like this. Uh, in this case here again, we have an observer and then we have a, a source back here and a lens plane. But now we're gonna let this lens plane be made up of a whole bunch of infinitesimal pieces of mass that are uh, scattered around that plane and we'll give them the X prime thing. And then uh, our light ray is going to cross that plane at X. Uh, so if we have a surface mass distribution across this whole thing here, uh, we can write um, the apparent deflection angle here as an integral with again these constants here of the surface mass distribution times DX. And then we have the, the one over R kind of formula here. So this is just like Newton's law in 3D, except it's a 2D version, right? Where we, we have a, a deflection just in two dimensions. Um, so one can also, just as with Newton's law, recognize that this deflection vector here, right? The alpha is now a 2D vector in the space of angles, uh, is the gradient of a 1D potential, where, uh, you know, in, in, 3D gravitation, if the force law is one over R squared, the potential is one over R. In this case, the force law or deflection law is one over R, so the potential is a logarithm. Okay. So this quantity uh, here in brackets is called the lensing potential. And uh, it's an integral of the mass across the whole thing. And so what we get basically is that the deflection is the gradient of the lensing potential. So there are some consequences of that. The first is that the gravitational deflection field, if you were to write it as a bunch of vectors, it's curl free. So that limits the, the number of possibilities of what a deflection field could be. Uh, and then it's also true that if you then take the divergence of the deflection or the, uh, the Poissonian uh, second derivative of the potential, you get back the mass density or more specifically, you get two times the surface density over sigma crit. So this quantity, sigma of, uh, in a given direction divided by the critical density is called kappa or the convergence for a reason that we'll see in a moment, all right? So you have a complete analogy here to the Poisson formula for uh, the origin of electric fields, for instance, okay? 
All right, now let's get back to weak lensing. Weak lensing is when we're talking about slight displacements of the image due to the lensing. So what we're interested in in weak lensing is the Jacobian derivative of the source position with respect to the image position. All right, and uh, so you can see that's like taking the second derivative matrix of the, um, of the potential. And we usually write that derivative as in this form. Uh, it's going to be symmetric because these are second derivatives, so that has to equal that. And so we write 1 minus kappa minus gamma 1, 1 minus kappa plus gamma 1 on the di diagonal, and then minus gamma 2 on um, the off diagonals. And uh, we can do that just by taking uh, 2 kappa uh, uh, is the trace of A, and we know that's true. That's the same thing as our Poisson relation, saying that the trace of this relation um, is uh, 2 kappa, uh, and uh, well, 2 minus 2 kappa. And then gamma 1 and gamma 2 are these different combinations of second derivatives, these asymmetric second derivatives of the potential. All right, so why do we write it that way? Well, it, because it, it lets us uh, visualize what the second derivative matrix is doing. So if I have just kappa and no gammas, then the second derivative matrix looks like this. And you can see that what it's doing is sort of expanding or contracting the X and the Y directions equally. So that means if the galaxy actually looks like the blue circle, then either a positive or negative kappa will mean that the galaxy was either overall shrunk or overall uh, expanded. So that's why we call this magnification or, or convergence, all right? Uh, and then, uh, if we had just a gamma one, then the matrix has a one minus up here and a one plus of, or the, on the uh, y-axis. So the circle is gonna be stretched in the y-axis and shrunk in the x-axis or vice versa, depending on the sign of gamma one. So that's taking my circle and making it do this, right? So that's what we would call gamma one or sometimes we call it gamma plus because, well, I don't even have to explain that, I hope. Uh, and then, um, if we have a gamma two, um, the horizontal and vertical directions are not changed, but I get uh, an X stretching along the Y direction and a Y stretching along the X direction. Uh, if you can think about what, what that means is basically that I'm gonna take this uh, circular object and I'm gonna stretch it either diagonally at plus 45 or minus 45 degrees. And we call that gamma two, or I like to write it as gamma cross, again, for what I hope are obvious reasons. Okay. So these kappas and gammas are the weak lensing observables, right? And they are the second derivatives of a, of a lensing potential, right? Uh, and just a quick diversion here, the shape of a galaxy and the shear, those are what we call spin two quantities, all right? So uh, how do, can we define it? Well, uh, if we have a source of light, you know, with a elliptical shape with a major and minor axis A and B. Uh, there are different ways to define the ellipticity. The way I'm going to use today is to say that it's A squared minus B squared over A squared plus B squared. And uh, if the position angle of the major axis relative to the x-axis is beta, we write E1 or E plus is equal to E times cosine two beta and E2 or E cross is equal to E times sine two beta. Now in most vectors, right? If you, if you had a vector quantity, you would, or a spin one quantity, you would have a cos beta or a sine beta here. But if I have an ellipse and I rotate it 180 degrees, right? It's indistinguishable from the original ellipse. So I only have to rotate an ellipse 180 degrees to come back to the identity Whereas for a vector, you have to rotate at 360 degrees to come back to the identity, right? So that's why these uh, ellipticities, it's like a polarization field as well. It's a spin two quantity. And what that means is that if I have a certain object whose E1 and E2 I've measured in a certain coordinate system, X and Y, if I wanna measure it in a different coordinate system, say X prime and Y prime, that's rotated by phi, then my new E's, the E primes, are related to E, the original E's by a rotation matrix, but I have a factor of two uh, on the angle here, okay? Now I bring this up uh, by all the way, by the way, there's also this very nice complex notation where 
E1 plus IE2 is just uh, altered by uh, a factor of E to the minus two I phi. Okay, and the reason that we need this rotation, especially if you're gonna do some of these exercises later, is that remember that when we were doing the circularly symmetric uh, lenses, we talked about shear that was always tangential to the mass in the middle, right? Well, if I have a mass in the middle here and a galaxy over here that's tangential, I, I wanna know what part of this, if its ellipticity is tangent here. Well, E1 and E2, they tell me what parts of the ellipticity are you know, either plus or cross-shaped relative to the X, Y axis. But when we're doing our galaxy shear measurements, we usually wanna know it relative to the radius vector from the lens to the source, right? So we're gonna to have to execute some rotation to get components in a different set of axes. Okay. All right, so uh, you know those equations sort of sped by. I'm gonna throw some more at you in a minute. Um, but those equations were giving you the, the way to get from a mass distribution in two dimensions to a, uh, a shear and a, a convergence versus direction. Uh, now let's jump into three dimensions since the universe actually is three dimensional. And the way that we do this is by uh, adding up all the deflections that happen between the source galaxy uh, and the observer. And so we're adding up the effect of all the lenses between our eyeball and the source of the light, right? Now, technically we should add them up along this sort of wiggly path that the photon is gonna take from uh, on its journey. But we use here the Born approximation, which you might've had in some classes, which is we're gonna add up those deflections by integrating them along the unperturbed line of sight, okay? And that is a very good approximation for gravitational lensing. So we're okay with that. Um, so in the Born approximation, uh, if I just let, uh, if I add up all the potential and deflections, et cetera, along the line of sight, um, and I use some general relativity, uh, Friedman, Robertson, Walker metric uh, identities, we can get that uh, the effective convergence in a given direction is going to be the integral from us to the co moving cosmological distance um, to some uh, source of some familiar looking things here, right? This is uh, sigma crit coming in here. And then I have the density uh, along that line of sight um, times, uh, oh, oh, sorry, as a function of direction and distance, okay? So rho here is the actual three-dimensional density of the universe now. And then I have uh, uh, a um, differential for the integration of the line of sight. And A is the scale factor. Okay, which is implicitly a factor of the distance on the line of sight, because we're integrating back in time as well as back in direction. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you can do some manipulations and uh, end up with um, an equation here that says the kappa, the divergence, is equal to the integral from us to the source of light uh, of all the lenses. And delta, remember, is the overdensity right, the fractional density relative to critical density, um, times this combination of distances and constants that uh, are generally called the lensing kernel. And going back to a discussion yesterday, this lensing kernel, if you look at it, uh, it's gonna peak about halfway between the source of the light and the observer, all right? So if I have a bunch of sources that are located at redshift two, I'm gonna be most sensitive to mass distribution, uh, fluctuations that are around redshift one or something like that, okay? All right, so uh, this is all zipping by. You can look at the details here later, but basically I just want you to realize that what we're doing in three dimensions is basically just integrating up all the, the masses along the line of sight. And it's gonna still be true that uh, there's a lensing potential, which is the integral of the actual 3D gravitational potential along the line of sight with some kernel attached, and that uh, the Poissonian of that is gonna equal two times the kappa. Uh, and the deflection angle is still the gradient, and the shear is still the second derivative. So we save all those formulas 
they're all preserved when we jump from 2D into the full 3D thing, right? So it's still true that our, uh, our deflection is a, a curl-free field, right? Uh, and because the, um, be, the, these equations here show that if I know kappa, I can use, I can solve that plus one equation and I can get the potential and I can get uh, the deflections and I can get the, the shear, right? But it's also true that if I know the potential, I can get the shear and the magnification. And if I know the shears, I can also get back the mass distribution, okay? So that is part of the magic of weak gravitational lensing is we, we measure this pattern of distortions and then there's some pretty simple calculus that will get you back the actual mass distribution. And remember, it's the total mass distribution. It's not just the baryons or the things that are emitting light, okay? Uh, another way to think about this, by the way, is that you're, you're measuring actually the, the space-time metric along the line of sight, okay? Now, it may be hard to believe that you can measure this deflection pattern and get back the mass distribution, um, but let me show you what they tend to look like. All right, so on the left is a projected mass map of some slice of a universe uh, determined from an n-body simulation. On the right is one of these whisker diagrams uh, of what the shear pattern would look like as we looked through that mass at some galaxies in the background. And you can see some very familiar things. For instance, here's a big cluster uh, or something like that. And in its vicinity here, you see this characteristic tangent uh, alignment of the shears, right? And where I see that kind of pattern here, 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 I can see they all correspond to mass concentrations over here, okay? You are, you may think that there's some magic here, but actually uh, your brain can do this transformation very well without you even having to think about it. Speaking of neural nets, um, here's a, a picture from a catalog of the kind of glass that you use on shower doors, right? It's called obscure glass. And remember the purpose of this is so that you can't see the naked person on the other side of the shower, right? Um, but if I show you these, here's a picture of clear glass. Here's a picture uh, taken of the same scene through one of their products. And uh, I bet that you can already tell by looking at that, what the texture of the glass is that you're looking through, right? By just looking at the distorted image. Uh, in all of these cases. So our brains are somehow capable of, of making these kinds of transformations also. And I should say that this bumpy piece of glass is a, a fairly perfect analogy to what the universe is. Because remember, uh, we're looking at the projected mass density or some projected potential. And uh, if I were to cut a piece of glass that had the same surface shape as the potential does, it would generate the same shear pattern has to do with a time delay formalism, if you want to think about it a little deeper. And yet another way to think about this is, uh, you know, our theorist friends like to predict what the power spectrum or the Fourier modes of the mass distribution are going to be. So let's imagine that we have one Fourier mode, some sine wave of uh, more mass, less mass, more mass, less mass, as illustrated here, okay? And that we're looking through it at a bunch of circular galaxies behind it, right? Well, what's going to happen is that in the in the less rare in the rarefied regions, um, the the light is being uh, stretched apart before it gets to us, and in the denser regions, it's getting pulled back together. And what that is going to mean is that we're going to see a shear pattern that is uh, alternately along and perpendicular to the k vector, the wave vector of the mass itself. Okay. So uh, in Fourier space, if you're a person well, there are some weird people like me that like to think in Fourier space, but uh, in Fourier space, the, the relation between the shear pattern and the mass underneath it is very simple, right? You, you Fourier transform the shear pattern, you basically right away have the Fourier transform of the mass, okay? And one thing that you'll see is that there, uh, as far as the K direction is concerned, this is all E plus, right? It's all either along or perpendicular to the K vector. What cannot happen is to have the opposite kind of behavior, the E cross pattern, where the galaxy shape is oscillating from positive to negative 
at 45 degrees to the K vector. That kind of pattern cannot be produced. That's what we call B mode. And that is, has to be absent from your shear measurements. And so if you actually, uh, after you make your shear mass, one of the, your, your shear measurement, one of the first things we do is uh, take the proper derivatives to generate this B mode component and see that it's zero. Because if it's not zero, we know that we have some instrumental or some other contamination of our shear pattern. Okay. Uh, just to go back for a second, this, this E mode, B mode split, uh, if we think about, again, our, our circular mass distributions, if we have some kind of uh, halo, then uh, of over density, we're going to expect this kind of pattern. And this is an E mode pattern, if you do the right calculus, where the derivatives, where the, the shear is always uh, perpendicular to the radius vector. If I had a place in the universe with negative mass, uh, well, what is negative mass? That is, it doesn't exist, but I can have a negative over density, which would be a void, right? Then a void will generate a negative E tangent, which means that instead of look going this way, it will go vertically at the top. And so we would have this radial looking shear pattern. And in the dark energy for in survey, for instance, this pattern has been detected around places that are absent of galaxies, right? we can tell that they have essentially negative mass. What you will never see is a pinwheel pattern like this, where we have the component that's at 45 degrees to the radio vector. That has to vanish mathematically. Okay. So this is a good check uh, that we have a gamma one and a gamma two, um, and, and those are two different fields, but we know that the whole deflection field was generated by a scalar one component mass field. And so there must be some redundancy between gamma one and gamma two, because we only have one degree of freedom. And the absence of this B mode is what uh, explains why there's two gammas, but only one kappa. Okay. All right. So those are some things to keep in mind. All right. So now uh, the last bit of math I want to show you is that we have this way to take uh, a, a shear field that we might measure using methods we'll describe in a few minutes, and we can transform it into a map of the mass. Okay. Well, uh, our, uh, our theoretical friends, when they're making predictions of what a given cosmology is gonna generate, um, the easiest thing to predict is what's called the, the mass power spectrum, which you learned about earlier this week. And uh, that means that the power spectrum of kappa of the lensing divergence is related uh, to the power spectrum of the actual mass fluctuations. And that relation in something called the limber approximation uh, is very simple, okay? I can measure with gravitational lensing this projected matter power spectrum, right, a kappa, where everything has been compared to sigma crit and integrated along the line of sight. Uh, and the theoretical prediction for what I should matter, what should measure, is related to what the theorists say we're going to get for P delta here by this simple integral between us and the source of the light. Uh, and it's pretty simple because you just take the DZ along that line of sight, take the power spectrum here, you put the this lensing kernel thing that we had a couple of slides ago, and you just square it. And there's an H and a chi squared in there, okay? So this is the beauty of the weak gravitational lensing technique for, uh, for cosmology, which is that what you see is very closely related to the total matter distribution, not the baryon matter, not the visible matter, but the total matter, including, you know, most of Elisa's dark matter as the majority, all of the dark matter, but it's the majority of the matter. And so it's a relatively clean signal compared to galaxy surveys, which are actually easier to do in some sense. If I make a map of the galaxy distribution, I have to worry about the relation of the locations of the galaxies to the location of the, the dark matter, because it's the dark matter that the theorists are really better at predicting. Okay. So this is why we love, I fell in love with, uh, with weak gravitational lensing, uh, which is that it is a simple thing 
to relate to the theory. And I like simple. Okay. Okay. That was the simple part. <laughs> uh, measuring this can get harder, right? And we've already encountered uh, one of the reasons, and that is that uh, to remind you from yesterday, what lensing will do is take a bunch of circular sources and uh, stretch them out, you know, around any mass, so that you see these coherent shape patterns, right? But as mentioned, galaxies aren't really circles; they come born with a variety of shapes. Everybody knows that. And so you can't look at just one galaxy and decide how much it's been lensed because the amount of stretching that weak lensing generates on average is much smaller than the amount of variation, intrinsic variation in the shapes of galaxies. Uh, so what that means is that this is necessarily a statistical pursuit. We're going to have to collect images of a bunch of galaxies and average them down to try to get to uncover the lensing signal. Okay. And this is called shape noise, right? Uh, and just to uh, get into this a little bit more, so here uh, is the unit circle of ellipticity. Ellipticity can't be more than one. So if I plot this E plus and EX for a given galaxy, it's gonna lie somewhere on this unit circle with the horizontally stretched galaxies here on the right, the vertically stretched ones are at negative E1 uh, or and et cetera, okay? Now, if a galaxy uh, is circular and it gets, I apply a shear to the field, it will move to the right a little bit if I apply a stretch of all the images this way. And this little vector diagram shows you that if a galaxy is say born here, uh, after it gets sheared, by the same shear, it'll end up there. Okay, so this is just real pretty simple math to make this uh, this this graph. Um, so what it essentially means, uh, and this is not exactly true, but each galaxy is going to have an intrinsic shape that we'll call E i, all right, which we can break into its two components. And again, here's our definition in terms of uh, major and minor axes, and it's altered by some applied shear, so that roughly speaking. The observed ellipticity is the intrinsic one plus twice this gamma number, okay? So if I go out and I measure a pile of galaxies and I average their observed shear, then what I'm gonna get is the average of their intrinsic shears, which is going to head towards zero as I average more and more galaxies because galaxies have no preferred direction in space, right? Uh, they occupy this unit circle uh, in a, an isotropic fashion, right? Uh, now, if I average a finite number of them together, this isn't gonna average to exactly zero. It's gonna average to uh, sigma E over root N, where sigma E is the dispersion of the ellipticities, right? In other words, it's sort of, what is the RMS uh, typical not roundness of a galaxy? Okay, so that sigma E is an important number. That's what we call the shape noise. Uh, and so if we average N galaxies together and then uh, average their shapes, um, the gamma is gonna be the same for all of them if they're close to each other on the sky. Uh, so I can turn this around and say that my estimator for gamma one, for instance, is gonna be the average one component of all my observed things divided by two and I know that I'm gonna have a noise of sigma E over two root N in that measurement, okay? So this is our first issue, is that measurements of weak lensing are intrinsically noisy. Uh, and uh, how would you reduce the noise, therefore, in a weak lensing measurement? If I wanted to measure gamma to more and more accuracy, what do I have to do? Anybody can shout something out. What do I have in my capacity to change here? I am not licensed by the creator to change the ellipticity distribution of galaxies. I just have to increase N, right? So that's what weak lensing is practically. It's the quest to measure the shapes of more and more galaxies. Uh, how many would we need? Well, typically this sigma E value, if you just look at galaxies, is 0.3 or 0.4. Uh, and if I have a galaxy out at redshift one, 
um, you do your cosmology calculations in theory, and you'll find that the stretching or shrinking of that galaxy, the gamma on it, is typically about 0.01 or 0.02. So if I look back at uh, this formula and I want the noise here to be, say, 100 times smaller than the shear, so that I've measured my shear and my cosmology to high accuracy, right? Then that's going to require that I measure the shapes of 10 to the six galaxies, a million galaxies. And that's actually wildly optimistic. There's some things in here that we haven't talked about that are gonna push that up more towards 10 to the seven, 10 to the eighth, okay? So weak lensing is a numbers game. I want lots of galaxies, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of history here. Uh, the first detection, the claim detection, of any weak gravitational lensing effect was made or published in 1990 by uh, my postdoc advisor, Tony Tyson, uh, who was the first one who said, hey, I'm gonna to try to actually measure this stuff. <clears throat> in 1990, Tyson, Valdez, and Wink uh, published a paper with this chart in it, where they were looking at the faint galaxies surrounding one of the universe's most massive galaxy clusters, uh, Abel 1689, and dividing them into whether they were aligned sort of tangent to the uh, circle around the galaxy, around the cluster, sorry, are, are they radially aligned, or are they somewhere in between, or are they round enough that you can't tell which direction they point? And they saw this excess in the tangent category, right? Uh, and then another cluster, um, uh, 1409, same thing here, more galaxies in the tangent category, okay? Um, not coincidentally, this observation was done not long after photograph, uh, after the first people started to use charge coupled devices or digital detectors instead of photographic plates on telescopes. And uh, that was a huge advance because, first of all, if you get things off a digital detector, you can put them into digital form and then you can do things like measuring shapes um, carefully uh, with algorithms and numbers instead of just with your eyeball, which is important if you're trying to eventually measure a few billion galaxy shapes. Um, and also because these are more sensitive detectors, so they could actually see the shapes of galaxies that were behind these massive clusters, right? All right, so this was a very big advance. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, about 10 years later, it took 10 more years to first detect the shear in random directions of the sky. Remembering, remember that looking for shear in the vicinity of a massive galaxy cluster, that's the easiest place on the sky to find shear because that's where there is the most, right? But to find it in random directions or what we call cosmic shear, that was not accomplished until 2000. And uh, about three different groups um, published refereed papers within a few months of each other um, claiming this detection. And uh, I'll show you, of course, the picture from the one that I was on. <laughs> so, uh, but our measurement, if, if to do this one, we had to measure the shapes of 10 to the fifth galaxies. And uh, what you can see here, is the uh, tendency, the y-axis on this plot, is how likely are galaxies at a certain separation from each other to point in the same direction. Uh, it's what we would call the, the two-point function of shear, okay, or the ellipticity correlation. And you can see this uh, barely significant rise um, away from zero, all right? So, so this is the signal of dark matter fluctuations in the generic universe. First detection. And that was made uh, by surveying one and a half square degrees of sky on a 16 million pixel camera, which you all have in your pocket now. But at the time, that was a big deal. That camera is sitting in the Smithsonian Institution and was also the camera that was used to discover a lot of the high redshift um, supernova that led to uh, the um, discovery of the acceleration. Okay, let's step ahead. Uh, this is uh, my former postdoc, whom some of you know now, Mike Jarvis. We, uh, another paper, uh, again, I'm showing you mine, but there are other papers going on at the same time. Uh, by 2006, we had used that camera to measure um, uh, about 2 million galaxies over 75 square degrees. 
uh, using that same 16 megapixel camera, which was soon superseded by a 64 megapixel camera. And now this two point function is becoming more significantly detected, right? We can start to actually say something about cosmology at this point, not just that there is lensing, but how much. Um, step ahead till after the, the final publication of the so-called uh, Canada, France, Hawaii telescope lens project. They looked at 4 million galaxies over 154 square degrees of the sky using 340 million pixels. And now you can see uh, uh, even uh, better measurements of this, um, this correlation function. And then jump ahead again to uh, last year when the project that many of us at Michigan and Penn are involved in released uh, the cosmological analysis of half of our dark energy survey data. And that includes 10 to the eighth galaxies spread over 4,200 square degrees of the sky with a 500 megapixel camera, okay? And now there's more dots than you can look at, but each of these yellow lines is a measurement of um, this two point correlation function between galaxies at two different sets of redshifts, okay? So there's all these different squares because we've divided the galaxies into four sets at different distances and uh, can measure the auto and cross correlations of all of them. These are the B modes, which you can see are all nicely consistent with zero. But uh, the total signal to noise in here is much higher. And this has allowed us to measure the clustering amplitude uh, in the universe to a precision of um, about five or seven percent, I think. I don't remember the exact number. Okay, so that's the state of the art as of today. Although there's two other surveys going on right now, or actually all of us have finished taking our pictures and we're still analyzing our data. The kilo degree survey or KIDS and the hyper supreme can survey or HSC. You're gonna see news from all of those in, in the, uh, the next couple of years. And then in the future, things are really gonna get wild the Rubin Telescope is going to conduct this legacy survey of space and time, LSST, and that's a brand new telescope with a, uh, a, a 2 billion pixel camera uh, that is nearly complete in uh, the mountains of Chile, and it's going to survey probably about 18, 20,000 square degrees of sky that are useful for weak gravitational lensing. Uh, and... Uh, it should measure well over a billion galaxy shapes. Okay. And sometime in the next few years, well, actually, uh, in about 28 days, the Euclid spacecraft is supposed to be launched uh, from uh, uh, on a, a SpaceX rocket with an ESO payload. And then a few years from now, the Roman spacecraft will be launched by NASA. And both of those are meant to uh, have among their primary goals measuring the um, this shear correlation function. And being in space helps because you get a sharper view, you have less atmospheric blurring, so you can see the shapes of smaller galaxies, right? They're not just blurred away to nothingness, right? So that's what's coming in the future. Those two galaxies, these two space projects won't measure as many galaxies as LSST, um, but they will, and they have fewer pixels, but they uh, will be, you know, kind of distinct measurements that uh, have less, fewer difficulties in some ways with their measurements. Okay. All right, so that is uh, kind of the roadmap, right? You now can sort of see how we go from a simple deflection formula to statistics that we can uh, turn back into cosmological constraints, right? Okay. Um, so maybe I'll spend a few minutes on this before we take a break. Um, let's back up now and think about, all right, so this, one of these nice new telescopes gives you a picture of the sky. Uh, how do you actually determine the shear uh, or these ellipticities of the galaxies from this image, right? Well, if it's an elliptical galaxy, elliptical galaxies have that name because they're elliptical in shape and you can choose a major and a minor axis. Now, for a galaxy, it's not like it has an edge, right? It just fades from bright to faint from the center out. So for an elliptical galaxy though, if you were to choose a certain brightness level and say, draw the contour or what's called an isophote 
of that brightness level. That would be an ellipse, and you could assign an A and a B to it and get an ellipticity. But uh, what's the ellipticity of that guy, right? Here's a irregular galaxy. How do you define an E for this? If we were stuck using just elliptical galaxies, this would be a much harder thing because ellipticals are a small fraction of the galaxies that you see on the sky. Most of them are much messier. They don't have actual ellipses as their isophotes. But uh, it turns out that they're okay. You can do it. And uh, what we do instead of actually trying to draw an ellipse is to measure the second moments, the uh, second central moments of the galaxy's light distribution. Your detector hands you back uh, a grid saying how many photons you know, landed uh, on the telescope at each part of the sky. And that's our intensity function, I. And it's a function of x and y on the sky. Well, I can uh, take the moments of that. So if I just integrate the intensity across the sky, I get the total flux from the galaxy. But if I put, uh, if I choose a center for the galaxy, x naught and y naught, I can measure the centroid or what we would call mx and my here. And I can also measure these squared quantities, x squared or xy or y squared. Okay. And uh, if I turn, uh, if I define E1 to be mxx minus myy over mxx plus myy, an E2 to be 2mxy over mxx plus myy, and a radius squared uh, in this way using the flux, then I have E1, E2, and a size that transform under the action of gravitational shearing or magnification in exactly the same way as the E1 and E2 and size that I would have measured from the isophote of a perfectly elliptical galaxy, okay? So what we do with the galaxies is we don't sit and draw the circles, we measure the second moments of the light that's coming from each particular galaxy, right? Okay, um, and maybe I will uh, take the break here for five minutes. And when I come back, we'll see a little bit more about this. And I think we'll have time to let you try to analyze a galaxy catalog, right? So five minutes, is that sure. nominal break time? Well, we'll reconvene at five of. Hi. Hi. Um, so the thing that you did on the pre.
Yeah. Good. All right. So we've got a way that if you give me a picture of a galaxy, I can assign it an E, a shape, uh, and then I can start using that and averaging it with all the other galaxies to say something about the matter distribution uh, or these distance factors, which come from whether there's a, a lambda or not. Okay. Um, I think I'll skip this slide. This is just explaining again how these kappas and gammas are related to the different shapes. Um, but uh, there is a problem with what I just described, which is that whatever image I give you from my telescope of a galaxy, it's not really what the galaxy looks like because every image has been blurred to some extent by uh, the optics of our telescope. And uh, if it's a ground-based telescope, the atmosphere, as most of you know, is constantly roiling about. And for optical images, at least, it also blurs the images. Okay. There, uh, and so even a, a source of light that was a delta function would be spread out into something of finite width. Even if you have perfect optics, you're still going to get this spread because of diffraction. Uh, you probably mostly heard of, you know, in your e &M classes, right, the, the diffraction limit of the telescope, lambda over d. So we're never going to, we don't get to view galaxies exactly as they are. We're, we're viewing them through what's called a point spread function, or PSF, that's going to be characteristic to that observation, right? Uh, so th that means that the size of the galaxy that we see is bigger than its true size. And in most cases, it also means that the ellipticity of that galaxy that we see is not its true ellipticity because the PSF itself is usually not perfectly circular. Uh, just to give you an example, if I'm taking a, my picture of, you know, coordinate so-and-so of the sky and somebody came along and kicked my telescope while I was taking the picture, um, all the galaxy images on my detector would look stretched out, right? And uh, so I, I detect this enormous correlation of their shapes. And I, you know, I write my paper and send it to nature about how I've discovered this huge concentration of dark matter in the universe or something. And probably nature would publish that. But, uh, but uh, the experts who look at it would say, no, that's just something, an instrumental effect, right? So what we have to do is uh, before we can proceed, we have to take these ellipticities that we measured and somehow remove from them the effect of the instrument, the optics, the atmosphere, et cetera. So uh, how do we do that? Well, it turns out this is the reason that nature puts stars in our sky. As cosmologists, we generally don't care about stars. They're, they're just in the way of the galaxies and all that extra galactic stuff that we care about. But stars are basically delta functions, right? So every time I look at the image of a star, I am looking at the point spread function. Okay, so I can measure the point spread function of any image by picking out the stars uh, in that image. And by the way, how do I tell a star from a galaxy in an image? Does anybody know that? Uh, the stars might have diffraction spikes, yeah. Um, and uh, on a bad night, they, you can't see those spikes, but what, what would I do? Could okay, try to fit a Gaussian to it. Now the PSF is sort of a Gaussian, but not exactly. Um, but I think you're on the right track because when I fit a Gaussian, I have to fit the size, right? And stars are the smallest images in the sky because they're intrinsically delta functions. A galaxy has a finite intrinsic size uh, and it will look bigger, okay? So we try to separate out the stars by finding the things that are basically all the same size in the image. And then we use those to measure the PSF. And then we have this nice little miracle that occurs, which is that if I assume that my observation here is the convolution of the true sky image with the point spread function, uh, which you can write a convolution this way, right? Uh, you integrate over an X prime and then have an X minus X prime in the PSF. Well, if I ask what is say the second moment MXX of that observed image, I will uh, jump past the actual proof here, but show you that in fact, if I have uh, an image that's the convolution of the sky and the PSF, 
then its second moments normalized to the flux are equal to the second moments of the galaxy plus the second moments of the PSF. So when I convolve two things, I actually add their second moment sizes together. Okay. So that gives us an obvious strategy for correcting our observed moments back to the intrinsic moments of the galaxy. And that is to take our observed moments here and subtract from them what we measured from the point spread function. Okay. And that will recover for me the intrinsic sky moments of each galaxy, which I can then do my MXX minus MYY over MXX plus YY on to get my E1 and likewise for E2, all right? So it's very important that we know to great accuracy the PSF and that we subtract it away, okay? Um, now, just to give you a sense here of how well we have to do that, uh, remember that the typical cosmic shear is one or two percent change in shape, right? A, a gamma of 0.01 or 0.02. To do precision cosmology, we want to measure that to about a percent accuracy of itself, right? So that means any spurious effect that's in our galaxy shapes that's at the level of E of 0 0.0002 is going to mess up our cosmological results. So we have to measure these shapes. Each individual galaxy gives us a rather crude measurement of the shape, right? Because of the shape noise. But what we need is for the collective accuracy to be extremely precise. And because we're using the same PSF for every galaxy, if we get that PSF wrong, we've gotten the whole cosmic shear wrong. Okay. All right, so we solved our problem of shape noise uh, or of galaxies that aren't ellipses. We, solve the problem of the instrumental blurring of the images, but there are other problems in this measurement too to overcome. One of them is that images have noise in them, right? When you collect a finite number of photons, there's always a Poisson noise. You're not measuring, you know, the perfect rendition of that. Uh, so every galaxy image, every image of everything is noisy. And the formulas that I gave before, uh, these simple formulas here for getting a shape out of a galaxy, it turns out that if you divide two noisy things, the quotient is biased. Okay. You can just do a simple experiment on Python to show yourself that that's true. Uh, even worse, and it's also true that those moments, those E's, 1's, and E2's also have noise on them. Now, to some, in some sense, we're okay with measurement noise on our E1 and E2 because we already know that there's shape noise of like 0.2 on each galaxies. So if I have a measurement noise of 0.02 because of finite photons, I don't mind. You know, it's, that's not really hurting me because it's not the dominant source of noise. On the other hand, if I use these formulae here, these integrals go uh, formally from zero to infinity. And that means that I will actually have an infinite amount of noise on my measured E1 and E2s if I try to use these second moments, okay? So this beautiful, mathematically perfect version of E1 and E2 turns out to be completely impractical. Uh, it's necessary to measure the second moments in a way that has uh, finite and hopefully small noise. Uh, and the way that we end up doing that is instead of taking this integral, uh, for our second moments to be over all of uh, all of the sky, we um, put a window function in that is some kind of function that cuts off at a certain radius so that we keep it finite. But unfortunately, uh, once you put this window function into your definition, then uh, these perfect formula, these perfect properties, well, there are ways back of knowing exactly how the shapes transform under the application of gravitational lensing, they don't work anymore, okay? So it actually took us uh, about 20 years of development as the experiments kept getting more galaxies and we had to measure things more and more accurately. We had to keep on coming up with new algorithms for measuring the shapes of actual galaxies from images to keep the noise level and the biases in particular down below the square root of n shape noise, all right? But at this point, we have gotten good at it, 
uh, good enough that galaxies, uh, well, basically we can measure shear to a part per thousand accuracy. Okay. And I won't begin to try to explain how we did that to you, but uh, there's, there's plenty of interesting reading and math there. Uh, there's three methods, in fact, that have been proposed by different people that have uh, achieved this part per thousand accuracy. And by the way, how do we test that? We can't test it on the real sky because we don't know the right answer for the real sky. So what we do is we make simulated images of the sky that we have sheared ourselves, measure them with our algorithms and see if it, the output of the, the measurement matches the shear that was put into the simulated image. All right, so that's uh, some stuff I won't explain, uh, but let me just give you a few other things that we have to worry about. Um, here, uh, well, another thing is that the detector does not give us a pure function, a continuous function of X and Y, right? Every detector basically has pixels where it's gathered the photons into little squares. That turns out to be not so much of a problem. All of the integrals over X and Y that we wrote down can be turned into sums over the pixels. Right? Um, and that's okay as long as the pixels have uh, done something called Nyquist sampling of the point spread function. So uh, if the pixels are too big, you have a problem, but for any given telescope, there's a pixel size that works. Okay. Uh, and then we have to worry about the fact that detectors themselves aren't perfect. For instance, the number that we get out of the detector is typically not a strictly linear function of the amount of light that hit it. Um, but we have also gotten quite good at uh, understanding what our detectors are doing so that we can uh, remove this, what are so-called the uh, instrumental effects uh, or the, the personality of the detector, take that out so that we get an image back that is a true reflection of the light that hit it. Okay. Uh, and then a couple other things that are minor problems. Um, the point spread function is a function of wavelength. And uh, every observation we make is through a certain finite range of wavelengths. So the PSF was different for some of our photons than for the, for the blue photons and for the red ones. And uh, you have to look out for stuff like that. Um, and then there's other things like selection biases. Anytime you make a cat catalog of galaxies, you have to decide which ones are in your catalog and which ones aren't. Did I you know, detect it at a certain level of significance? And it turns out that sometimes shearing a galaxy can make it easier to detect. And that's a selection bias because it, now it means the galaxies in my catalog are not a random sample of the sky. They're biased towards the places where the shear is in a certain direction. Okay. Uh, so this is just some details that we had to worry about over the years. The big problems are in red here. Uh, one is blending. Let's see if I have a nice picture. No. Um, once we start measuring more and more galaxies on the sky and taking deeper and deeper images, we will see that there are places where galaxies overlap on the sky. You can see that easily if you look at something like the Hubble Deep Field or something like that. So that means that every pix uh, some pixels have two galaxies contributing light to them. So how do you decide how many of those photons belong to this galaxy versus to this galaxy? This can make it hard to measure the shapes without biases. And so that's a frontier research problem that's particularly tough for these next generation surveys that are taking very deep images of very many galaxies. And then the last thing that's really important is redshifts. It doesn't do us any good to measure the shear to an accuracy of a part per thousand if we don't know what redshift the light originated at, right? because we have to know how much of the universe the light has traveled through if we're gonna be able to convert our dark matter densities you know, into the proper cosmological things. And uh, if you're doing a billion galaxy survey, uh, it's really completely infeasible technically right now to go and take spectra of a billion galaxies and measure their redshifts from absorption and emission lines. Um, the biggest spectroscopic, spectroscopic experiment, DAISY, is going to measure, I think, 10 or 20 million spectra by the time it's done. Okay. So we have to do something that's a little cheesy. Uh, we look at the colors of the galaxies, the broadband colors, which are cheap to obtain, uh, and we try to estimate the redshift of the galaxy just by what color it is. This is called photometric redshifts. They're clearly going to be less precise. Um, but that's been a, a big topic of research for a few decades now. 
And uh, I could give you three more. Well, I really wouldn't want to, but uh, you could, you know, have a whole week like this that's just about photometric redshifts if you want. But suffice it to say that at the moment, they are not a limiting factor to our accuracy. Okay. Uh, we are still able to conduct the latest gra gravitational lensing surveys, dark energy survey, KIDS, HSC. Um, the, uh, the results that we are obtaining as of today uh, look like this. When translated into um, cosmological parameters. So this is uh, from uh, a very recent paper um, that has a lot of authors on it uh, that is combining the results of the partially completed dark energy survey and the partially completed kids into one analysis. And the contours here, the dark and light colors are the 68 and 95% confidence, or I guess what's the Bayesian word for that, uh, credible regions, um, for parameters. And on this, this one may be a little bit easier to understand. Omega matter, we all know, that's on the x-axis. And then sigma eight is a measurement of the amplitude of the fluctuations of um, density, uh, well, in, in the current universe, in some linear limit, okay? So this is how lumpy the universe is. This is how much mass there is. And the results from the cosmic microwave observations, Planck are right here. And this is uh, assuming that um, the universe is a Lambda CDM universe because they measure the lumpiness of the universe at redshift of, uh, of 1100. But what we're measuring with weak lensing is the lumpiness of the universe at redshift 0.2 or 0.3. Okay. So in green, we see some results from DES. In Yellow, we see some results from kids. Uh, so the combination of them is pink. And uh, this is the same thing, but just with a slight coordinate transformation. So let's look over here. And what you can see is that the blue and the purple look kind of in the wrong place, kind of in different places. This is what's called the sigma eight tension, which is a word that I really hate. This word tension is what people who write papers say when they see two numbers that are different, but not different enough to draw an actual conclusion from. Um, so they just say their intention. And it's been consistently true that the weak gravitational lensing experiments are coming up with sigma eight values that are about two sigma or maybe 10% lower than the Planck measurements imply, okay? So this is one of the biggest questions in cosmology because if we had that result at say a six sigma difference, we would have to conclude that lambda CDM is the wrong theory. Right? And that would be pretty exciting. Okay? But uh, at the moment, it's really only about a two sigma, although it is a two sigma result that like three different experiments have gotten. Okay, So that gives you a little bit more of an inkling that there might be something going on, okay? But, you know, I, I'm gonna try to discourage you from writing papers that explain why it looks like this from theory, because it's still quite possible that this is uh, just measurement uncertainties, okay? But we're getting more data, so we're gonna see, okay? Uh, so that leaves us with how long? About 25, 30 minutes? Less. Less, okay. Less than that. But uh, maybe with that time, what I, so this is my, this is today. This is where it all ends up, right? Um, let me see if I can give you the opportunity, uh, if you can type, to try to do some weak lensing analysis, right? So on the collab, uh, there are two problems. Um, there's a problem six and a problem seven. Uh, in problem six, I've given you a catalog of galaxy shapes, the E1s and E2s. And I'm gonna try to lead you along to see if you can tell me, uh, and these are the shapes around a single mass, say a cluster of galaxies. And I'm gonna see if you can figure out like what the velocity dispersion of that cluster of galaxies is from this shape catalog. 
Uh, it, problem seven is harder. So if you're ambitious, you could jump into that one. In this one, I've given you an actual image of the sky, uh, which is not shown here. So I'm going to have to run the notebook. But it's an image with a bunch of dots on it that are stars and galaxies, both lens galaxies and source galaxies. And I've given you some code that will measure those second moments. And it would be your job to turn that into a shape catalog and then say something about the masses of the lens galaxies. Um, so we don't have enough time for, certainly for anybody to do both of them. And I think it's too little time to do uh, any one of them maybe to completion, but I would suggest, you know, working with somebody next to you on them uh, and see how far you get. And um, meanwhile, we can do some questions or something um, for part of the time. Maybe we'll give it 10 minutes or something and then do questions. Uh, and um, I do have, as I said, there's a notebook up with solutions that I came up with um, that you can, if you want, you can just look through the solutions that I wrote to see how it was done, or you can try to do it yourself. All right. So uh, as again, it's more work than we can do now, but uh, go ahead and give it a, a little bit of a shot. And if you have any questions, I'll wander around here too. Well, I'm gonna, maybe we let people work for what do we have 10 or 15 minutes? Let's go to 1240. So, shall we do 25? I think that's the max, but that we really be finished here. 1240. 12 yeah. Okay, so let's so start taking questions 10 minutes before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, we'll give you 15 minutes to just work on analyzing your shear catalog. And uh, maybe I should just point out, if you're doing either of these problems, remember that, that you're going to get the E1s and E2s of the galaxy, and you're going to have to rotate them to get the part that aligns tangent to the circle to the source.
for your friends. Oh, that's fun. Let me do that. Let me do that. Uh, you got to hack it something. Uh, if you go to tools and then you go to settings and then you go to miscellaneous, you're going to add all these different little <laughs> for your friends. I don't know. Somebody showed me yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a Google. Yeah. What is all of I don't know. Maybe how, how frequently so they come power. around. Many power buttons. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of random. I'll try this some power. Yeah, I'll be many. So if you use it with caution. X Y is it like a combination of the X and Y? Sorry, what was your reference? The Git mode. Yeah. 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 There's a X Y. Zoned out the lecture. I'm assuming it's the um you know to get those you know M M M X X M M Y M. It's not sure what I'm supposed to. Put in for uh, the variable X because there's like if you scroll up, um, I'm not quite like a tab, yeah. and then there's X Y separate. So I don't know. If well, X, meaning X and Y, those are the it's my positions of the center of the galaxy. Right, but how do they? And the E1 and E2, that's going to incur the, the moment information. Right, I understand. But in the function itself, yeah. it's just got a variable X and Y. What? I don't see what function you use. Do you see it? The get moments. There's not. Did you probably save it? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm going to save it. Okay. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Okay, get moments. Now I see it. X, Y, R, A. You're just saying, like, how do you input those? Like, the actual... Yeah, like, what... Uh, must be like a tuple, right? No, it's yeah, it's why the tuple. Um, wait, so at the end of doing all this your measurement stuff, we're supposed to be left with yeah, like yeah, a surface density map, right? Yeah. Right. So, like, like ultimately, so the point is that given, like, you know, some RA and DAG or X and Y coordinate, you can attribute an actual, like, density or, or mass to that position, right? Or is it that specifically you're only measuring a mass for the one galaxy that you're lens? Right. This is, this is, this is the weak lens. No, we're doing all of them. You know, yeah. Getting some sort of analysis. So then, like, the, how do you attribute what's part of this halo versus what's part of that halo? I don't think you do it. You just, um, you know what I mean? I just found out what my power does. What is it? What is it?
Okay. Um, I guess with the five to seven minutes left, um, I know this is not enough time to finish that problem, but it's there if you feel inspired to take it up later or look at uh, my solutions. But uh, let's see, I guess I can run this notebook. Um, so uh, you can keep working, but also maybe at this time we could take questions on anything from the past two days, in, so, including the problem here. Here's one online. Can you do something to reduce intrinsic shape noise? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes and no. Mostly no. Uh, can you reduce the sigma E of a bunch of galaxies? Uh, you have a, a limited set of tools with the standard data that we have um, because galaxies are galaxies. You can try not to make any dumb mistakes like measure E in some way that uh, makes a much noisier result. Um, but you're kind of stuck with the galaxies that you got. You could, for instance, it turns out that elliptical galaxies are less elliptical than spiral galaxies, if that makes any sense. In, in the current lingo, they tend to be rounder and they have lower shape noise. So if you were interested in this, you might say, well, maybe I'm only going to use the elliptical galaxies. So then you lowered sigma E, but you, so you paid a price of having a lower N because you, you aren't using all your galaxies anymore. Okay. So short answer is no. There's a longer answer, which I'll just hint at, which is that uh, some of our uh, University of Arizona colleagues have this really cool idea that uh, for spiral galaxies, we know there's a Tully-Fisher relationship between the velocity dispersion and uh, the brightness of that galaxy. And if you play around with that a little bit, you can figure out that if you could measure the velocity dispersion of your spiral galaxies, you could get an independent measure of its intrinsic ellipticity, which could lower the shape noise quite a bit. So that is uh, a pretty cool idea um, that's uh, called kinematic lensing. But to do that, you would have to have a spectrum of all of your source galaxies, right? And a pretty good one. So. Any questions from the classroom? There's one. Yeah. Uh, my question was about, will be about uh, image distortion uh, in when we use different uh, observe uh, different telescopes. So if uh, we know a PSF for our data, uh, we should we firstly uh, you make uh, the convolution of image for obtain uh, for restore image with to take into account point spread function mm -hmm. and only after this uh, right. do uh, anything else. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat that question. Uh, so the point spread function of the instrument gives you a distorted image. And the question is basically, should we deconvolve or try to undistort that whole image before we start measuring shapes? And the answer is that you could but it would be a little bit of a waste of your time. And the reason is that when you deconvolve, you're asking, please tell me the entire image the way it looked. We don't really care what galaxies look like. So unlike other, if you're a weak lensing person, galaxies have no intrinsic interest of their own. They're just wallpaper of the universe, right? That you're trying to measure shapes from. So all we really care about galaxies is, uh, what their moments or their ellipticity is. And most of our algorithms, instead of deconvolving the whole image, they actually use algebra to skip that step, to say, I know this, for instance, in the algorithm that we saw here, the super simple one, we didn't have to deconvolve. We just measured the second moments of the PSF. We measured the second moments as observed, and we corrected the moments, right, for the PSF. We didn't correct the whole image. So uh, most of the techniques do something in the processing that is in effect deconvolving, but only for the parts of the image information that we care about. Okay. Yes. So, so, so uh, 
I'm not fast and why is blending a problem because eventually we will add up all of the images together, ah. together, together, right? So yeah, uh, why is the problem that those galaxies stack up together uh, themselves? Right. Uh, so the question is, is blending really a problem? Because if we're going to add up the galaxies later, right, to, to get a mean, a shear estimate by averaging them, uh, is that any different from just having the galaxies added up on the picture to start with? And the answer is that, yes, it is different because what we want to average are the ellipticities of the two galaxies, uh, which is not a linear the ellipticity of the sum of two images is not the same as the uh, sum of two ellipticities of the images. Those, those operations don't commute. I could give you an example. Um, here's one galaxy and another galaxy, right? Actually, let me make them overlap so they blend, all right? These galaxies both have an ellipticity of zero. If I put them together though, it's an object with a pretty substantial ellipticity, right? Another problem is that this galaxy might be at 0 0.5 redshift, and this could be at 0 0.8. So now I have a problem because these two have been sheared by different amounts because um, you know they are passing through different sets of dark matter. And so when I go to do my statistics, if I measure a shear from this, which as a blend, like how should I model that? So yeah, it's it's harder. Yeah, if they're at the same redshift, it's actually okay to just let them be overlapped. But yeah, there's one. So uh, when the light ray travels from the source or uh, encountering the lens, given the fact that universe is mostly occupied by voids. So they will travel more encountering void regions. And because voids do this uh, radial alignment of the uh, of, of uh, yeah. you know, orientation of these galaxies, does it has any effect on the uh, result? I mean, yes. So uh, the question is basically we have to account for the fact that most of the photons voyages are through void regions, not through over densities, yeah. right? And that's okay, right? Because uh, if we look at our formulas here, uh, we integrate this kappa on the whole line of sight, including the voids, right? Uh, here, okay. Right, we're, so there are most of the integral has uh, uh, most of the Z in the grand is places where Delta would actually be negative. However, uh, it's only a little bit negative. Whereas if you pass through a galaxy, it's a lot positive, right? Then this is just the skewed distribution of Delta in the nonlinearly evolved universe, right? So our formulas are taking into account. Otherwise, we would be making some very bad mistakes, right? You're, you're correct about that. Um, but we do have to integrate through the voids as well. Thank you. That's Looks like lunch, huh? For the day. Thank you again. Okay. Thank Before we go to lunch, let me mention one of our local students, Chi, posted on the, here he is, raising his hand, posted on the random channel, there's an informal and unofficial uh, tour of the Top of Angel Hall with telescopes. He is a telescope, of smaller telescopes, people who like telescopes, highly recommended. That's on the random channel, check it out. See you at two o'clock, we, we meet again. <laughs>